China is in a very difficult situation and the geopolitical issues are important and the capital issues are important. I think the real question in all of this is, are we going to have war or are we going to have an intense competition? And uh, right now, I think all the sides recognize that we're on the brink of war. I'm Jim Haskell, editor of the Bridgewater Daily Observations. Yesterday, we shared part one of a conversation with Bridgewater founder and CIO mentor Ray Dalio, in which he discussed the first two of the five big forces that he sees as having really shaped economies, markets, and societies throughout history. And those were the financial and economic force and the domestic political order force. And Ray described how these dynamics help explain the economic and political risks he's seen right now. In today's podcast, we're sharing part two of that discussion in which Ray addresses the third force, the international world order. This is something that's top of mind for Ray, and you'll hear him articulate how he's seen the U.S.-China conflict, as well as assessing China's economy. He also discusses the rising prominence of India, which is an increasingly important geopolitical player. Ray and I did not focus in this conversation on the two other forces that he cites, acts of nature, namely climate change, as well as technology. We'll do that at a later date. So let's get right into the second part of my discussion with Ray Dalio. Ray, let's move to the third force, the international world order force. You've been writing about this issue for quite a while now. Over the years, you've spoken about the importance of the shift from the unipolar you know, U.S.-led world order to a multipolar world where China is rising and perhaps even in a position to eclipse the U.S. On this front, I just want to say there are so many conflicting signals. You know, we talked about the U.S. facing a number of challenges, and we discussed that in part one of our podcast. But China is also facing a number of challenges as well in terms of its economy, its debt, its demographics, and things you know of that nature. So help us disentangle this and give us your thoughts on how you're assessing China and the U.S.-China rivalry more broadly. Yeah, I'll get into China in particular and answer your your question. But but what you can see is it's like two wrestlers or two boxers. And now the question is, which boxer, which wrestler is going to win? And so you see that when we have moved from what was a largely unipolar world and a cooperative globalized world into now this world of great conflict. And so the question now is sort of which side is going to win. And then there are these rounds that we're encountering. And in this round, this one's doing well. And in that round, they're down. And we're looking at it like, I don't know, a football match or a competition. And so before I get into the particulars of China, and there's the particulars of the United States and there's the particulars of the world, before we get into that, I think that, yes, um, I think it is clear that the basic picture that this is going to happen and that the sides are now lining up for a conflict, I think that 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 I laid out in the book, I think that that's happening now. I'm not saying I'm going to be able to pick the winner or the loser, and I don't even know necessarily what that uh, conflict is going to look like. I have thoughts about that, and I'll be happy to share that, but recognize that, okay? That's the important thing. So as this is coming up and we deal with this this conflict that's arising, then we're dealing with the war. We, We will get into... Uh, What are the problems of China? What are the problems of the United States? But we're not going to know who the winner of that war is for a very, 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 very long time. The fact that we are coming into the war and that we are at the brink of that war and that geopolitical thing operating is the big thing. I think that's a really important point, you know, regardless of who is winning or losing you know, the big deal thing you're highlighting is that we're in this conflict now. And just to be clear for our listeners, you're not saying there's necessarily going to be a physical war, although that's certainly a possibility, but that there's different types of wars. There's technology wars, there's capital wars, there's trade wars that could break out or we're already in. 
So, uh, Ray, can you describe a bit more the consequences of being in this conflict and what it means for the world and what are the questions that it's raising in your mind? Okay, now you see how the sides are lining up, like allied and access powers in World War II. You see the same dynamic, you know, how does Europe play into this? Uh, they, Europe doesn't want to get involved in Asia. And then how is that going to, how does NATO and Russia, and then uh, Russia and China, and how they're lining up? And then what does that mean in terms of deglobalization? So recognize the patterns of history, such as, okay, sanctions always took place. You have economic war sanctions. And so, and, and then the economic war in World War II, before World War II, it was the sanctions, the United States cutting off oil, embargoing oil, very similar to the United States bar embargoing or cutting off chips to uh, China, and then the freezing of assets. That led to the bombing of Pearl Harbor. So I think when, as we get into what's going on in China, let me also deal with the issues of the of, of the you know the conflict. There are between the United States and China are issues that um, are red line irreconcilable differences, and they um, they're very risky. They're related to Taiwan. They're related to China's dealing with Russia and, uh, you know, how do they provide support and is that OK? And whatever. They're related to capital movement. It is, of course, correct <clears throat> that as there's this um, an almost impending war and preparation for the war, that American companies or foreign companies want to leave. And in fact, Chinese companies consider, OK, my door is going to close. Can I get out? What, what does it mean to be global? And so you see the Taiwan issue, you see the um, support of Russia issue, you see the whole geopolitical issue emerging. And so I want to emphasize that the most important thing is watch um, these irreconcilable differences. This is also happening in our political year and in, in, in the elections. You will see in Congress and you will see and the elections and so on, a much more, uh, let's say, macho uh, or hawkish uh, policies related to China and, uh, coming together. So I just want to emphasize as we before we get into the problems and the issues within China um, to recognize that this force is definitely coming together. The sides are aligning. And so you, we can get into the question of what does BRICS mean? What does the G20 mean? What does the G7 mean? What does it mean? How does the order work? Well, it'll be disorderly. So let's get into the economic situation with China. How are, how are you processing what's going on there and the challenge policymakers are facing? I wrote a piece that there were, um, you know, the major issues in, in China. Um, some people think that I'm, uh, you know, a China lover. Well, I, I, I do say I do love the Chinese culture. I've come uh, many friends in China over a bit, particularly long period of time. But I, my job is to look at things objectively. And I'm saying, OK, so, yes, let's describe what that looks like. And I, I mentioned these problems that they have. First, they have the debt problem. It's a classic debt problem, like written in the book, like the things we talked about, about the debt. They have to do a beautiful deleveraging. In my opinion, they let it go two years, about two years too long that the debt uh, problem uh, didn't have a restructuring. And so uh, one, you know, one man's debts are another man's assets. And as it passes through the system so that the real estate, which accounted for you know 70 percent of all savings and about 25 percent of the economy passes through the system and also local governments um, were borrowing money uh, and having money that that became unsustainable that has passed through big re debt restructurings are uh, very much political issues because when they're when the decisions are made people um, as a result of how they're made that what what are the haircuts uh, who receives what? There are big impacts on wealth. So there's a big political issue associated with a debt restructuring. A, a beautiful deleveraging de is still a pretty ugly thing. It's a, it's a very difficult thing. It's just done well. But anyway, that went on too long. And then, of course, we have the issue of the geopolitical, uh, the world uh, issue. 
In other words, what you mentioned, the question is which government will cause problems for uh, investors. Or as we move toward an increased uh, likelihood of war, and people are aware that if you're going to have a war, um, it, it's not going to be good to have your assets in that country that's having a war, particularly, you know, let's say, if you're an American uh, owning assets in China in that kind of an environment, um, that that becomes a, a, a very risky thing. And then, of course, then there, that war dynamic means that there's a reallocation of resources to be uh, produce things at home and to make things uh, set, you know, safer. And as a result, that has its implications. So China, yes, it, uh, China is in a very difficult situation and the geopolitical issues are important and the capital issues are important. I think the real question in all of this is, are we going to have war or are we going to have an intense competition? And, and uh, right now, I think all the sides recognize that we're on the brink of war. War is a very dangerous thing. And so, um, and that war can take the form of um, much more severe sanctions, let's say, economic sanctions and pain. And, um, and that would have giant uh, implications for economies. Uh, because of how the, they're intertwined, the economies are intertwined. It'll be very inflationary. It'll be uh, very inefficient in terms of the productions. And so we're right now at the at the edge of that. Neither side wants things to get worse, but I I think both sides would say uh, that there's a significant risk that we're right at the edge of that brink. So, uh, yes, there are problems in China of, uh, along those lines. There's a, a much more autocratic government, which, by the way, is what the classic pattern is. If you look at uh, wars and, and such periods, uh, which Xi, by the way, described, he's, he, 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 to summarize his view, is that there's the hundred year storm on the horizon. And if you look at periods of great storms on the horizon, or great storms when they encounter the great storms, that's the th threat of uh, collective decision making. And so there becomes a much more uh, autocratic governments, um, even in the in United States during World War II, and of course in other countries, you have to follow the rules and you will be severely punished and it becomes much more autocratic. So there is that dynamic that also is counterproductive because it inhibits the flexibility of their economy. Um, people are afraid to make decisions because it's a risky kind of environment. So that's what's going on in China. And that's in the context of, you know, what's going on in, in the world and the relationships between them. Well, let me just uh, finish this section, uh, Ray, by wondering whether when you outline sort of, you know, the, the five big forces, that internal, external, and then the financial and economic. I mean, a lot of investors wonder why China doesn't just take your advice and engineer a beautiful deleveraging like was done in the West. And is it because, and, and so far anyway, I'll is answer. it because of these other things or is there some uh, other reason? The two main reasons are that it is it is a very arduous, difficult, politically difficult thing to do because it allocates wealth. And second, but they'll have to do it. Um, and the second is that after it, they still have to have a plan for those who were living on the debt, what happens with them. So, for example, the local governments. The local governments made their money by a combination of borrowing and selling off land for real estate purposes and so on. Okay, that's where the vast majority of people are. We could look at, we think of China, we think of Shanghai, Beijing, uh, Shenzhen, and so on. But there's a large, all of those provinces out there that are uh, economically and financially uh, dependent on uh, that form of borrowing, and things will get much worse. So the issue is, as they're wrestling with that, is how to deal with that. We have now have just a new government. 
In other words, most people, most everybody was replaced uh, in March. And so um, the taking on that job and dealing with it is a is a big job. They will, you know, have to do it, in my opinion. But those are the big impediments. It's a difficult and threatening uh, thing. I I should say that the Chinese have an excellent understanding of the cycles because their view of history uh, started in really before 212 BC. Uh, that, 212 BC was when China was united under the Qin Dynasty, um, but even go. And so they see these cycles. There's internal conflict about what to do. A lot of populism, in a sense, exists in China as it does in the United States. And there's that conflict. Then it leads to more autocratic and it leads down this path. Almost, It's almost mechanical as one thing leads to another. So that these this is a challenging thing for an, uh, a new administration. It's going to be a very difficult thing. And then, Ray, we've discussed the U.S. and China and their respective sides. But you have also talked in the past about the effects of this conflict on non-aligned states, you know, the ones who aren't really in either camp. How are you thinking about the impact of the U.S.-China big power conflict in regards to those countries? When we look at the United States and, and you know, its allies and, and so on lining up and you look at uh, Russia uh, and China and those allies essentially uh, lining up, there is also a great portion of the world um, that does not want to be uh, aligned and wants to operate in the middle. And if you look at the history of wars, it's always the non-aligned, the those um, that are neutral during the war that do well. They do better than the winners of the war. The winners of the war still come out of it, uh, typically or quite often with a lot of debt. Um, Great Britain won the war um, and, it, and it was broke. And so as you look at this, and then you start to see the emergence of India, you see the emergence of uh, the ASEAN countries, you see the renaissance that's taking place in the Middle East, um, particularly in, you know, in the Gulf con countries, the UAE and, uh, and Saudi Arabia in terms of how that is. The elements of the countries in this environment that do well, the three things that determine how well a, a a country does. Is it good financially? In other words, does it have a good income statement and balance sheet, meaning do you earn more than you spend and that you have assets that are more than your liabilities and you're financially sound? The second is your internal conflict. Are you working well together in a healthy competitive environment to uh, be productive? Or are you at odds in, in, in a form of a civil war of sorts, an internal conflict? And are you in an international war of sorts? Those countries that are uh, financially worse off and inter have internal conflict and a lot of external conflict um, have problems. Those countries that don't. So when you go around the world, in the non-aligned, you can see that there are parts of the world that are flourishing and net benefiting from that because the um, others who are almost uh, the, uh, moving out or uh, uh, go to other places, these places sometimes become talent magnets that uh, people from around the world go and they have the financial resources and they can flourish and they could be creative. I'm not saying the United States is not a talent magnet. It can be, but it's a difficult, it's a different situation. We have a lot of talent here that's very, extremely inventive. One last thing on the world order force. You've been talking more recently about the rise of India. You know, and India is in a pretty interesting position now because it's got a lot of economic potential. And it's also a very valuable ally from the West perspective against China, but also able to benefit from its relationship with Russia. So considering India's economic potential and geopolitical significance, I'm wondering if you think India has the ingredients to be a major global player and whether investors should be taking an active interest. Approximately eight years ago, I put together long-term estimates of growth rates based on health indicators. Um, and since then, 
uh, India had the highest projected uh, economic growth. And um, all along, I've described India as uh, having a great deal of potential. And India looks to me where China, it was when I first went to China in 1984, it, it, it is now having reform. It is opening up. It is having reforms. And, and so Modi, to me, looks like Deng Xiaoping. In other words, he's come into a place which had, which had an enormous amount of potential. All the indicators, you can review those indicators if you care to, but low per capita debt, a highly educated population that was inexpensive to access and so on and so forth, uh, the classic indicators, a lot of potential, but they didn't have the reform. And so Modi is a Deng Xiaoping to me in terms of creating that element of reform. And then um, and so now as the giants are having their particular challenge uh, and you have a country with a great deal of economic potential that is not aligned and not going to um, it's it's navigating you're going to have the emergence of that. So you're seeing, for example, their technological capabilities and other things creating a great opportunity. So that's how India looks to me. Now, they have to develop their capital markets. Well, you know, there are issues. I'm not saying there are issues in India. There are issues in every country. The issues in India for the capital markets is they have to have uh, capital market reform. They have to have foreign exchange reform. It's difficult to invest uh, internationally, an international investor to invest in India, particularly in any uh, size. Um, that's a problem. So those are the elements um, for an investor. Um, there's also a desire, I think, in India to develop it with internal capital. So what you're seeing more is um, as the internal level of wealth becomes greater, those internally, Indians themselves, um, ha, um, have almost a monopoly on being able to develop the main industries and so on. And there's, um, you know, an element of a desire uh, to protect that that can stand in the way of the, you know, the attractiveness of, of, of investment in, in India. We'll see how that evolves. All right, Ray. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time. It's been a great conversation and I look forward to doing this again with you real soon. Thanks, Jim. The world's an interesting place. I enjoy discussing it with you. Thank you.